Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast, brought to you by HypeBot.com. As always, lots of love and a huge shout out to Bruce and everybody over at HypeBot for Absolutely. everything you do to support the podcast and to support music. Um, so, Jay, we have a special guest joining us. We have a special guest this week, and I'm, I'm thrilled that we've got him. Um, his name is Bobby Owinski. Um, Bobby... I first found out about Bobby from uh, one of his books, um, and it remains one of my favorite industry books, and I've sold a, a bunch of them uh, for you, Bobby, and that's the Music 4.1 Survival Guide for Making Music in the Internet Age. Um, but I, I love the uh, Music 3.0 blog. He's written, gosh, I don't know, a couple dozen books on the music industry. Um, Bobby, welcome to our, uh, our little show. Thank you so much for having me, Jay. Michael. So, so tell me a, a little bit. Like, <clears throat> I, I noticed that you've got extensive experience in the studio, in engineering, production, um, as well as something that's near and dear to my heart, which is kind of this new music business, right? You know, with streaming and uh, internet radio, and you know, all of that. You, you kind of. Um, you work in both sides of that as a, a writer and advocate and as an active producer engineer. Tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are and, and what you're up to. Boy, that's a big loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, for the and, and, you, and you have 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. For the first half of my life, I was a, a musician and um, I played in the studio. I toured. And then I and I, I was liking the studio more, and then just decided that I don't like being on the road anymore. Something that happens to everybody, I think. Yeah. Uh, although if your pay grade is high enough, you can't actually leave. But I wasn't quite at that level. So um, then I just spent the next third of my life in the studio as a an engineer and a producer, doing all sorts of different projects. Uh, but I started to write at the end of my career as a musician. And what happened was, um, I tell the story all the time, but I think it's a good one. The bass player on the tour came on the tour bus and said, I just got a job writing for the music paper. Music paper was a, uh, LA weekly style music paper out of New York. Very big for quite a while. And for some reason, I thought, if he could do that, so can I. So I reached out to a couple of magazines, and Mix Magazine gave me a chance. And um, I just came across that article not too long ago. It was about uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash and & Young, The Making of American Dream, that album that they did in, I guess it was the early 80s, and um, or late, late 80s. And it was so bad, the article that I wrote, it was like, oh, wow, this is... <laughs> horrible but that being said uh all, all of a sudden i started to get more work as a writer and at magazines and I've, i did hundreds of interviews for a dozen different industry magazines but i was still working in the studio i was a good engineer but i wasn't a good mixer but i knew all of the greats i mean i knew the a-list so i figured you know if i'm having trouble with this i bet there's a lot of other people and what if i write a book about it so there wasn't anything in the market i went to all of my friends and asked them what their secrets were and i put it in a book it was the mixing engineer's handbook and it was a big hit yeah and um you know everybody says the same thing after their first first book i'll never do that again <laughs> i've so heard many, that Yes, so many brain cells die that you say, I'm never going to go through that again. But since the it was a hit, I was convinced by the publisher to continue. And the second book was a hit, and the third one was as well. A hit yeah. is a, a, a relative term. It sold enough copies that they wanted me to do it again. Let's put yeah. it like that. I, and, and, it, and it was a series, yeah. right? Yeah, more or less. So then it got easier and easier and easier, and after I knew how to do it, it was, well, this isn't so terrible. So I started to write and wrote on different subjects. But, you know, you, you asked about, or you alluded to why I do a lot in different areas, and there's a couple of reasons why I write books. One is to be an archivist. Mm -hmm. 
meaning that there's a lot of industrial knowledge out there that I'm trying to capture before it drifts away into the ether. Mm -hmm. So the books are an attempt at that, hopefully somewhat successful. And uh, the other thing is, I just want to learn something. Yeah. So if there's something I don't know about, I figure, well, I know a lot of people that do. Let me find out, and maybe some other people will enjoy this as well. So that's always been the impetus. Um, the Music 3.0 book and the, the blog came about from me being more interested in the music business than the production side for a little bit, but having lots of questions about the new music business and how it was all working. Yeah. So that led to that. And, and then the same thing with social media. I did social media promotion for musicians, mostly because um, I was lucky enough to be schooled by some of the, the gurus of social media mm -hmm. when it first started. So I got pretty good at it by virtue of the fact that I had the best mm -hmm. that were helping me. Yeah. So I thought, well, let me see if I can impart this because there's a lot of uh, misinformation, shall we say, on the internet. So that, that's yeah. th that's how all that came about, really, and, and it continues to this day. Yeah, I think the social thing, there's so much misinformation out there. I think what you've written, and I think guys like you know Guy Kawasaki and some of these people who have really demystified and kind of helped guide people – um, is super helpful. I love the Music 3.0 blog because that's stuff that's dear and near and dear to my heart and Michael's heart, you know, kind of this new music business. Tell me a little bit about Music 4.1 because I can tell you that when I got that book, I, I remember it was over a holiday break and I was sitting on my couch just highlighting stuff and making notes and looking things up. It was the single best book I had found that kind of talked about all of these kind of new music business tactics and issues, but also it wasn't in jargon. It was in a way that if you were a touring musician, you could understand it. And if you were a marketing executive, you could kind of get something from it. How did that come about? Well, thanks. Uh, that book badly needs a refresh because it's a couple of years old at least. And, uh, and, and it was poorly named. It was originally Music 3.0. That was the first version of the book. And then it was uh, music 3.5, music 4.0, music 4.0, second edition, music 3.8, you know. So there's like five or six editions of that book. Um, I don't remember. I, at least five, I think. And it, wow. like I say, it needs another one, needs a refresh because we're definitely in a different period now. But it was mostly trying to analyze what is going on with the business and, and what are the misconceptions? And as you both know, there are many misconceptions about streaming, the streaming Absolutely. business. Absolutely. And how people get paid and why they get paid and, and why the, the rates are what they are. And, you know, you, you hear those stories where, you know, a songwriter will say, I had three million uh, plays on, on song and, or 3 million views or 3 million streams. And all I got was $33. And then you look at it and you say, well, it was actually more than that. There's five other writers on the song plus the publisher got 50% plus the streams came from a lower tier, the free tier mostly. And it came from out of the country. So, you know, there, there's all these, when you look at it, you go, well, there are reasons why this is happening. And there was actually more money collected than, than you saw. Right. So, I mean, that's common in the music business, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it, it, that's one of those things where, you know, we've always, Jay and I especially talked about how musicians need to get, educated on stuff like that they need to understand their contracts they need to understand their revenue streams but but this week i sort of had a little eye-opening moment where it was like you know what how do we educate the consumer the fan because i was having a conversation with a fan online who was like you know what um, downloading is terrible, illegal downloading is terrible, blah, 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 which is like, yes, illegal downloading is bad. And then they said, I will never, I will never stream music from Spotify or Apple because that's illegal. And I was just like, oh, my goodness, it's not illegal. And, and, yeah. and, and it's not stealing money, and you don't understand it. And all of a sudden I'm like, well, now we've got – the fans that don't understand this either this is a tough this is a tough nut 
that has to be cracked, how do you even begin to educate everybody on the reality? Right. And it's it, there's so much negativity out there and misinformation that people think, you know, like you mentioned a second ago, Bobby, there, I talk to people all the time that say, oh, well, streaming is ripping off, you know, the artists. Well, is a stream worth a download? I mean, is a download worth a CD or vinyl? I mean, they're they're kind of, well, they're not kind of, they're different experiences and different levels of engagement and they have different values. And, you know, when you've got a streaming service who's paying out, you know, two-thirds, 75% of their revenue to rights holders, um, I think that that's kind of good for the business. But it, you know, we always talk to our clients, and, and one of the first things we say is a playlist <clears throat> is not a marketing plan. Yeah. You know, there's there's so much more to it than that. And I guess what I'm getting at is that it seems that a lot of what you're doing is educating people and showing them that, you know, there is a lot of misinformation out there. What are what are some of the, the things that people approach you about that you kind of have to, you know, set them straight on? Well, the biggest thing is scale. Once upon a time, a million was a lot. Mm-hmm. It, it was in the vinyl days and the <laughs> CD days and cassette days. That, that was a lot. Yeah. And you'd, there'd be some serious money generated. In the digital age, a million hardly even cracks the barrier. (laughs) You know, you get to 10 million and people start to sort of (laughs) look at it. And and 50 million is sort of a minor hit. But you can see the scale there is all changed. So, and and really, 100 million, you you can consider it a hit. But now we're talking 100 times more than what we we considered was the hit once upon right. a time. Right. So that's what I try to impress upon people. It's like the scale has changed. Everything is different. Multiply it by a hundred and then it's reasonable. You know, you'll get artists that will say, I got a million hits or a million, million whatever, you know, right. I got a million streams, a million views. And you go, yeah, but okay, okay that's, it's all right. It's good, but it's not, uh, it's it, take a look at what, the people that are really making a lot of dough in the business are doing, and we're now we're talking billions. So yeah, yeah. I know it's crazy. It's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, when you're going about your day, is it mostly that you're in the studio and you're engineering and producing? I mean, how do you find time to write twenty four books and to, you know, have a podcast and a blog and uh, you know, all of this stuff, where, where are you focusing your attention, Bobby? Well, I, I have to say, I think I have adult ADD in that <laughs> I can only, you know, I can only work on or focus on one time. thing. No, no one thing, but for a short period. Gotcha. Um, usually I, I'm to the point where I'm only taking a project or two a year of production or mixing. Wow. I, it's more for fun. I want, I, you know, I want to make money and I make good money doing it, but it's like, boy, I better have fun doing this because it does take a lot of time from the other things that I like doing as well. Now I like writing the blogs. I like writing books. I like doing online courses. And if something is going to take me away from that, I, boy, I better be having fun doing it, <laughs> you know, or else, uh, I don't yeah. want to do it. So I, I have to say if I were to look at my day, the first two hours is, is all blog. You know, it's writing the two blogs. And if I have to write something for Forbes, which yeah. I only do a couple times a month, that takes another couple hours. That, the level of intensity for a, an article like that really goes a lot higher. You don't want to make any mistakes because you get right. called on it. and you called Sure, on it a lot of eyeballs. Yeah, so so that, that's a little more intense. Um you know, I, I'll do production for podcasts in in blocks. Basically, I'll do four or five in a row, and then I'll you know have them. And usually, every Saturday is is when I do post production for that and and get ready to to, to post it. And um, it depends if I'm in writing mode or not. If I'm in writing mode, then I'll get pretty intense. Writing mode meaning I'm writing a book. Then all of the rest of my time is dedicated to that. And uh, that will usually go for two or three weeks, something like that, maybe four weeks going up to production. A lot of times, uh, 
the writing is easy. It's the other stuff. It's, uh, it's graphics. Yeah. You know, and, and graphics are important. They take time and I do it all myself because, Oh, you do. I, yes. I used to farm it all out and it was frustrating because I, it would take time sure. to get back. And a lot of times it wasn't the way I had anticipated it. So it was like, I, I'm, if I do this myself, it'll ultimately go faster. So that that's what happens there. And, and I hate to say it, but a lot of stuff is like that. If I'm going to transcribe a blog or I have a podcast or an interview or something, I do it myself. Wow. And I, because I've tried to find services, but unfortunately the terminology of, of that's our right. Business I've done is, it. I know exactly what you're talking about. They'll, they don't do it properly because they don't understand all of those terms that we use, those, you know, the jargon, the acronyms, they, they don't understand it. So you end up spending so much time going back in that Thank you might correct well it yourself. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I, it becomes intense. Now, that being said, I'm always working. I just came back from a three-week cruise. I did a transatlantic cruise that went from San Juan to Rome. And I worked every day. Mm-hmm. But instead of working 10 hours a day, I work five or six, but I still yeah. worked. And, and yeah. it's like that. I'll go on vacation. I'll still work, but I just won't yeah. work as much. You kind of have to, you've created this beast. You need to feed it. <laughs> you know, you've got uh, then, so many irons in the fire that, you know, I'm sure it's challenging. Well, don't we all though? I mean, it, yeah. let's face it. We all multitask these days. Yeah. You almost have to, um, at the very least you're multitasking on Whatever you do, let's say if you're a musician, a producer, engineer, whatever that might be, an artist, you're still focusing on social media. And if you're going to do it well, it does take some time. Yeah. And that's what people, again, don't understand that they do have to dedicate a certain amount of time in order to do sure. it well. Sure. So, Bob, Bobby, let me yeah. ask you. I mean, we all know that this new music business changes fast. I mean changes every day that you wake up and something new has been announced something's changing it's changed what, while we've been on this call exactly yeah. <laughs> what is there one two things right now that either in the music business or in social media or or something that's really got you excited what's exciting you right now well i don't know that it it would be exciting so much, but it's the evolution. It, the music business has always evolved. It's always changed and it's changed with technology. And if you go back and look, you know, going back to the sheet music days, every time there's a new technology, the music business changes and grows with it. So right now we're in a period where streaming and where, YouTube viewing, video music viewing is uh, mature. That being said, now is a perfect time for disruption. There's going to be something new, a new technology, a new format, something that's on the horizon. Now, that's what I spend my time looking for, for and, and my ear to the ground. I haven't... Sure. I, now, I can't say I've found that yet, or I see the, the insight to the next trend, uh, musically or technology-wise, but my eyes are open for it, because that I, I know it's going to happen. It happens faster yeah. these days than it used yeah. to, so I wouldn't be surprised if next year there was something new, or the year after. I think you're right, Bobby. I think that, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about AI and blockchain and all of these different things, but quietly under the surface, these smart speakers are changing the way people consume music, right? I mean, the Amazon Echo and the Google Home and the HomePod, and I can tell you that from dealing with record companies and distribution companies, they're kind of grappling with, well, how do I deliver my metadata in a different way, you know, whether it's phonetically or somehow that my music is fast when people do this one of the things going forward is some of these smart speakers what do you think about those i don't know how convinced i am to be honest with you i do know i, I had um dinner with some of the people from amazon music 
a few weeks ago. And they, I don't want to say they bet the farm on voice activated music, but it's the reason for their growth. Mm-hmm. And they were Absolutely. pretty open about it. That, that, yeah. that was really pushing things along. And I think they put a lot of eggs in that basket. No doubt. That being, that being said, I'm not totally convinced that it's not a fad. And I'll tell you what will make, what will convince me that it's not. When there's a universal set of commands that work the same on every device, and there isn't right now. So yeah. I, I think, think that's a problem. Now, that being said, I think we're, I don't want to say a generation away, but we're X number of years away from that. And it's mostly the kids that are growing up with this now. I mean, children that are growing up with this now, they're going to develop that. So when they're adults, now all of a sudden we're going to have this universal language of how to talk to the computer. And you think of Star Trek. You walk in, sure. you know, uh, uh, computer, computer, coffee, 75 degrees, you know. So I, I think there's going to be something like that that happens. Now there's, there's chaos in all this. The other thing that's happening is the insecurity of it. And I just post, posted this on my blog, on my production blog, where there are ultrasonic commands mm-hmm. that will allow, will, will have, and, and we've seen this already, we've seen examples, but it could take pictures, it could dial, you know, on your cell phone or your smart device, whatever it might be, that will... We'll put objection, make objectionable or or less <laughs> less than desirable commands that you're right. you know, that you'd want. So uh, until that's kind of worked out, that's a problem as well. And I think that will stop some people from actually adopting when they begin to. If there's more of this that happens, it comes to the forefront. People are going to say, eh, "I'm going to wait on this." Yeah. I know, you know. I have I have one right here. As a matter of fact, I have an, I'm showing you an Echo Dot that I have yep. still in the box. Yeah. And I look at this every day and I think, so I hook it up and I think, uh, no. So at, at, uh, maybe I'll, I'll do it at a certain point. But I think I, you'll have a little bit of fun with it, Bobby. I've got all of them on my desk here. And it's it's interesting what they recognize. And when you ask them to play traditional jazz, what each one will play, or if you ask them to play you know, 80s music. I mean, the number one command for these things is chill. People come home and they, you know, play chill music. Well, what comes up? And as a as somebody like yourself, if you are recording music or helping musicians, how do we get their music to, you know, rise to the top? It just opens a lot of these, you know, questions um, on how people can and will consume music going forward. It's you know, all super interesting. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Jay and I have talked about these devices many times. I love them. I think they're fun. They're geeky. But two thoughts that I've always had about them. One is I feel like for su- real success, they need a killer app. And I, I don't know, is, is playing music a killer app? Because I can play music on multiple devices. You know, it need you know... Email was the killer app that really solidified a lo- so much stuff. And and I see all of these manufacturers going, well, it's got this skill, and we're announcing this skill and this. And I'm just like, I look at my own use, and still 98% of my use of my device is asking it to play music because it hasn't developed any other killer must-have skills yet for me. Maybe that's still out there, and they're still grasping for what that is. But the other point that I think about these devices is it's not so much the must-have smart speaker. It's the new interface is going to be voice control. That's what the interface of the future is going to be on any device. And I've got a four-year-old daughter, and she hears all the time, When I'm at home and I say, computer, play this, computer, turn lights off, she wants to control things. She doesn't understand what she's controlling. She just wants that to be her way to control. And I'm going, yeah, you know what? As she gets older, she's going to have this built-in expectation that every device she interacts with should be able to 
be controlled by her voice. That, I think, is what this is all going to lead to. But the problem is you can't control your iPad with Alexa control. As, as Jay was saying, and as we've all said here, there's no standard. I can't control my iPhone with this command, but I can control the Google app with this. It's it's a mess right now. It is. It yeah. really is is an absolute mess because all of these players want to block out everybody else from yeah. succeeding on their device. But at the end of the day, again, voice control is where it's going to end up because it just works. I, I, I can tell you the, the one place I love using my Alexa device is in my um, car because now it's yeah. truly hands-free. Now I can say, play this device, do this. Um, that's great. That convenience is is worth it right there. Right. If it's, you know, if they get their act together and it actually plays what you're asking for. Well, you know, yeah, we've, which... we've, we've, we've talked about <clears throat> this. I mean, as somebody yeah. who's played with all the devices, I can ask... I can ask Siri to do one thing, and it doesn't have a clue what that artist was. And, and Amazon Alexa does have a clue. This is the challenge as well, is you get accustomed and comfortable with one device understanding you. But if you have to use another device and it doesn't understand you, I want yeah. to throw my freaking Apple device out the car window because you suck. Now, all that being said, yeah, I do find it interesting that, Amazon, and I think Amazon Music is the real sleeper in all of this that we see in the music business in terms of streaming and distribution. Mm -hmm. yeah. And th they're, they're thinking that voice activation is going to be the, the big thing, and it probably, and it is for them right now, right. they know it, and right. it, it's pushed their, their numbers up substantially. They don't. They're they're cautious, but it, but one thing I got out of them was it was six million subscribers, so that's reasonable, not including Prime subscribers, which are ninety million, somewhere in there. So in fact, they're much bigger than anybody thinks. Oh yeah. Yes. Look, Bobby, I managed their business for five years for Warner Music Group oh, globally. There you go. I, I know how the sausage is made too, and even though they won't release those numbers, they'll say it's tens of millions. You're you're absolutely right. And they're growing faster as a percentage than the other DSPs, which is great. I think we need more of these digital service providers, not less, competing with each other on price and marketing and all of these things. <clears throat> but I wanted to ask you, since you're kind of closer to the musician than most people, how do you think this new music business is affecting musicians, songwriters? Do Are, are there less uh, going into the field? Are there less people willing to put money behind it? Are they just recording things on their laptop at home? Are they not going into the studio? How is this new music business affecting your production engineering world? Uh, a great deal. Yeah? Well, uh, let, me, let me look at this from two ways. My friends that I grew up in the business with are scrambling. And there's a lot less work than there used to be. Part of that has to do with the way technology works where there's less need for them. I'm talking musicians, most studio guys. Uh, and part of it is they're aging out. So that's another thing. So you, you look at that and you go, okay, so there's this whole group of people that made their living in music for most of their lives. And now they're not doing the same that they did. They don't, they're, they're not as in demand and right. a big part of it is the fact that it's not their playing capabilities or anything and the fact is they're they're just not needed as much because music production is based around loops these days it's based around samples it's based around backing tracks it's based around a lot of things that don't require live musicians so when i talk to Mm, 20, 30 somethings even 40 somethings that are in the business right now that are making hits they're so much less concerned with going in the studio. They're so much less concerned with hardware. They're so much less concerned with musicians and quality of musicians because they know they can fix it. And they do, and they do a great job. So 
people my age, some of them look at that and they go, oh, this is sacrilege. This is horrible. This is the worst thing that ever happened in the music business. Right. And I look at it and I think it's another evolution. You know, it's a, now we're in a hybrid situation where we have a combination of real players and, and, and electronic. Right. It's just the way of the world. Everything is changing and it's going to change back again. Sometimes there, everything goes in a cycle. Yeah. So, you know, again, the way I look at things is I, I never get nostalgic for the way it used to be. Cause I know it's going to change tomorrow anyway. Right. And it does. Right. No, I think, and you touched on that earlier. I think that's a key point that people miss is that the music business has never been static. You know, it's always been evolving with technology all the way through and it continues to this day. And that's not something new. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So that being said, uh, you embrace it or you move on. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. I think the challenge for some of these musicians is they've just, especially the ones that, that were successful through the 70s and the 80s, they got very comfortable being successful. And, and, and they are probably at this point in their life, their age, not the demographic that's very comfortable with change and adopting new technologies. I like the way my car radio works. I like the way my vinyl records work. I don't yeah. need to, blah, whatever it is. And it's just, I've said, you know, we kind of got to wait for a generational change here. You yeah. know, oh, we, it's we, happening. Yeah. The, the old generation yeah. just has to slowly disappear. And once they disappear, they'll be less get off my lawn you kids you know leave me alone i like what i'm doing here <laughs> well there'll be yeah. a new version of that, that new versions happen. of it no you're exactly yeah. right but you, you know it's interesting though um again talking production techniques uh, and you know i talk to, to different people in different stratas of the business all the time and one of the things that's interesting is the recording studio is no longer the 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 church that it used to be that's sad well in a way yes but in a way it's more practical these days where you find that things are done faster yeah things are done in hotel rooms there are mixes that we hear in the radio that are number ones or top 10 right. that are done wherever they're done on a laptop they're done quickly and i for one yeah. Love it like that. I, I want things fast. I hated it when we were in the studio yeah. and we'd spend two days getting a snare drum sound. That would make me crazy. It's like, <laughs> oh, come on, just, just, just do it. Come on. Right, right. Good enough. Let's move on. Yeah. And, and that's the way it is today. It's like, okay, we got to go. Right. Well, I'm nostalgic, Bobby. I, I think of the, the recording studio almost like the record store that I used to go into and the sights and the smells and the sounds. And, and I love going into a recording studio, but you know, um, I was working with uh, Richie Sambora and Orianthi recently, and they recorded their album in their kitchen at their home. Bob Rock came over. They got the equipment there, and they recorded an amazing album. I mean, these songs are fantastic. And for anybody who listens to them, they would think, oh, these were recorded in a big, giant studio because they're lush and they're layered. And your point is well taken. You can definitely, if you've got the skills, you obviously have the experience to do that. Not everybody does. It takes time and knowledge to do that. And certainly Richie and Bob Rock and Orianthi can, can do that. But I, I guess mine is really nostalgic. Um, I, I still love going into a recording studio and watching those things take place. But you're absolutely right. It's not necessary to make a great record these days. Now, all that being said... And I have this conversation with, with guys, my age, and, and again, the reason for the books is trying to capture some of that knowledge before it disappears because people don't go into the studio like they did and they don't work in those ways. Right. They don't think the same way. And some of that knowledge, it's really important of, like you said, if you're, if you're good and you know how to do things, you can work in any situation you can make it work with any kind of gear. It doesn't matter. It's going to sound sure. good. But if you don't have that, the, that level of sophistication, which is more and more difficult to get, then as a result, the product is going to suffer. And we've seen that. We've seen the product suffer a little bit. But, you know, that being said, the consumer is, is kind of used to it now. So what does it matter? 
Well, let me ask you something, Bobby, and and I've heard people on both sides of the fence about this. When you listen to music, whether it's on streaming, radio, however you listen to your music, you know because you have different ears than a lot of people. What are you hearing? Is the newer music that's coming out, is it like all the levels pushed to 10? Is it like super highly upfront, dry, compressed? Is there a certain kind of um laziness going into new music like some people claim there is or do you feel like it's really kind of opened up the creativity like the you know uh, the old days of when when this discovery and the beach boys doing pet sounds or the beatles doing pepper or whatever it is is it that kind of thing or is is it the other does that make sense well, I think for a while it was the way you suggested where it, there was a certain laziness to it and a certain amount of um, copying what was new, but that's always been the case. You you copy you know what's hot, uh, so we've always done that. Yeah. But that being said, no, I have to say it, it's not as – the trend is away from drying in your face. There's a lot more reverbs that that we hear now, a lot more depth a lot more layering than there used to be. And, and that I find refreshing. Um, you know, I have to say the people that are doing this and, and are consistently turning out hits, they know what they're doing. They're really great. So, uh, you know, I can't really say, Oh yeah, they're, <laughs> they're lucky. They're, you know, whatever. No, no, they're good. They, they put their time in, they know how to do this. Yeah. So I, you know, again, it's one of those things. Everything changes. It, it, it's production is changing now, but it it will and it will continue to. The, you know, again, I see it all. You know, coming back around at a certain point, people will go, uh, "I like the laptop stuff, but boy, it's really nice to be in a studio." <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we'll see more studios. But yeah. you know what? What's interesting is you talk to the studio designers; they're all busy. They're as as busy ah. as ever, and you go. Where are you building these things? They're not building commercial studios. They're building private studios. They're building a lot of studios for colleges, which is kind of sad. We don't need more people going in, in you know, than we have now on that. Um, colleges, unfortunately, and I'm talking about when you get down to the community college level and they have a recording program with the big studio in it, you go, okay, wait a second. You're giving people some false hope there. You know? <laughs> There's not that many, not that many jobs out there. That you know, and a, from a, a community college degree is going to get you in. So, and that being said, they got plenty of money, so they're spending it on, on you know these new fancy studios. As a result, all of the studio designers, I mean, every single one of them, they're all busy. Yeah. So yeah, you know, it, we have the yin and yang of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's just an example of you know, as Jay, as you said, you know, you can record an album in your kitchen. You can now actually build a a quality recording studio in your den, in your living sure. room, in your basement. You don't need to go out and buy some industrial plot and gut the building, and you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. Well, well, the the only place i'll disagree with you on that is if you need isolation you do need that because there's no way around it you need brute force you need big thick walls we haven't we haven't figured out isolation yet and that's just brute force Got so it. it's labor intensive and it's, it's yeah. product intensive and and as a result if if you know you're in the flight path of of an airport or something you got helicopters going over and you want it to be quiet it's going to cost some dough if that's not the case at all Yes, you can do it so cheaply. It's it's amazing these days. Yeah. Yeah, I do a lot of, you know, work with, you know, college music programs and I always ask the students, you know, that are into this, you know, how have you found success? And it's it's funny. It it, it spans a, a pretty vast array of ways that people find like I have met some of these young students who have had you know, just on their laptop, they've recorded music <clears throat> and it's gotten, you know, decent amount of streams and video views and some of those things. But I guess what I'm getting at is I think that some of that, it's such a different experience streaming and watching video uh, online than it is actually going and seeking out an album experience from someone 
um, they're, they're two totally different things. One of, one of the stats that Michael and I like to quote is that, you know, you talk to the, the people at Facebook and they'll tell you that almost 85% of videos that are watched on Facebook are watched with the sound off, you know, which is horrifying, yeah. <clears throat> but you know, it's just the way that things are. Do you, do you find that just because you're, you've, you're in a playlist and somebody's heard your song, are you finding that people are connecting to those or does it take a little bit more work? Well, I think one of the the oversights here is the fact that an artist still has to play in front of people. Yeah. No matter what. <clears throat> no matter how and much that, this industry has changed, that, that has hasn't. that hasn't changed. You still have to go out and play live. So why does a record label sign an artist? It's not because they think the music is so great anymore. I mean, at one point in time, you, you, you had the, the moguls that, that were definitely in love with their music and their artists. But anymore, the decision is, I'm signing you for your audience or for your pot potential audience. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so the best way to get a record deal is still have, you know, people lined up around the block every time you gig. Exactly. No matter, no matter what. And you better be good at, uh, enough to do it. The problem is, we're and we're seeing this over and over where you'll get someone in their bedroom that will make a really great album and have ne has never appeared on stage before and when they go out they're learning their craft and it's not it does you can't do it quickly you can't yeah. do it overnight yeah so what i mean i one of the things i, I always talk about here i'll bring it up again because i think it's important music definitely changed in 1982 or 1983 with the drinking and driving laws and it changed in the negative fashion now as, as wonderful as those laws are and they made a difference in in terms of of you know um traffic deaths and things like that i appreciate that but one of the things it did do is it gutted the farm team we went from having so many clubs a club on every block almost to, you know, we're into the point where there's hardly any in, in big cities. It, yeah. We just don't have the scenes that we did because of those laws. And as a result, you have a lot of artists that grow up not having the experience that they used to because you'd play in clubs. And, and when I started, I was 15 years old and I was playing four nights a week in clubs. Yeah. So, you know, I, I had thousands of gigs under my, you know, um, Thousands yes. of gigs that I did before I, I really got into the music, the so-called music business. And you don't have that luxury anymore. And No, that's a great point. That's a shame. <laughs> uh, it, it's completely understood why it happened. And, and yeah. granted, it, it was worthwhile from that standpoint. But on the other hand, boy, it, it really did affect music. But, but, but you, know, uh, you know, to that point, I've encountered <clears throat> musicians, artists who, who want to commit their life to a career of being a musician but they don't want to cut their teeth doing that stuff they for whatever reason they feel they shouldn't have to and it maybe it goes back to hey i've got a million views on youtube i don't want to play a dive bar to five people i'm better than that i need to go straight to three thousand <coughs> people ten thousand people right and and i i jokingly say you know did 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 VH1's Behind the Music put this false hope in all these new young musicians thinking, you know what? Wow, instant success comes right away. I'm not going to be stupid, but I want that. I want the millions of dollars, and I'm going to get there right away, and I'm not going to put 30 years into getting to that moment because, you know what, I've already put two years into it, and that should be more than enough. I, I, I'm sensing there's a lot of that out there as well when it comes to performing live. But guys, we both know that an artist like that doesn't last long. No, no. exactly. I know that. I know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I know you know. And, and the fact of the matter is, if if there's an artist that's out there that's gigging and, and getting one fan at a time and building up over a period of time, they have a sustainable career that's going to go on whether they have big hits or not. And, yeah. uh, I mean, Zach Brown Band, boy, is a good example right there where, the, you know, the gig forever before they started to, to break out. And there's so many artists that you can look at and say, well, they got real careers. They can go as long as they want as compared to, uh, you know, yeah. and we have this with pop artists, especially where they're kind of up and down pretty quickly. 
Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hey, hey, Bobby, we could honestly talk to you <clears throat> all day, and I, I hope that you'll come back on the on the podcast again and talk. Um, I, I've loved uh, chatting with you. Where where can people find you? I mean, I think this is a ridiculous question, but I'll ask it anyway for our audience. Where can people find you on the web? The easiest place is bobbyosinski.com, and uh, there are links to all my blogs and podcasts and books and everything there. So bobbyosinski.com. Yeah. I, listen, I, I love your writing. I love your books. I highely recommend them. Um, continued Bobby, success Bobby and keep up the great work. You, you need to follow online. You know, wherever, oh. he, whatever, wherever you like to be, he's there. <laughs> follow him on that channel because there's so much great information. Yeah. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jay, for having me. Thank Lots you so fun. much, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Take care. Really Anytime. appreciate it. Take care. Um, fascinating conversation. You know, Bobby, Bobby's been there, done it, written, a, especially yeah. written about it. Um, oh, my God, 24 he, books. Yeah. He, he's, he's definitely a person you need to follow. If you want to read books, go read his books. If you want to follow him on yeah. his blogs, read the blogs. But um, yeah. so much great information. Yeah, I highly recommend it, too. That Music 3.0 blog is one of my go-to places. It's great. But I encourage everyone, I know it's maybe even a couple of years dated, but the Music 4.1 book, which you can find on Amazon and everywhere, man, I had such a great time going through that and reading it and highlighting it and pulling little nuggets out of it. And what makes it special is there's, there's a lot of great music books out there, but Bobby isn't saying that he knows everything. He knows a lot, but he's going to industry experts and saying, what do you think about this? What's your opinion about this? And I think that's where you really get the benefit of a lot of other people's experience. So yep. I, I highly recommend it. And I also highly recommend that you head over to uh, HypeBot yes. and uh, check out uh, lots of great stories this week. This music business is changing, like we said, by the hour. Yeah, by the hour, thing, new things come up. So, yeah, um, that's it. Another episode of the Music Biz Week Music Biz Weekly podcast. We're out of here.